You are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Sussex County, Delaware Sheriff Jeffrey S. Christopher. Sheriff, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Sheriff, would you like to be referred to as Sheriff Christopher, Sheriff, or Jeff, or any other way? Yeah, Jeff is fine. Okay, Jeff, thanks. Now, Jeff, I just saw an article recently. Actually, it was last week. It was on March 8th or 9th, the title being Sussex County Sheriff Lawsuit Hit the Courtroom. I want to get into that in great detail in a moment, but before we do, for the benefit of the listeners, can you give them a little bit of background about who you are? Yes. I was born in Maryland and raised in Maryland with a police family, military family, and I also grew up in a veteran's home my mom was the proprietor of there in Maryland. And I learned very quickly about honor and the Constitution, the Founding Fathers' idealisms, different things that this country has been involved as far as the history of it. And I guess the pride and the engineering that goes into protecting the rights of the people and the Founding Fathers were right when they said it. And it's clear and impressed me very much. So I grew up to be a police officer, and I came to know after 26 years on the force in Maryland that there was a decay, if you will, and a diminishing of the value of the police system the way it used to be, one-on-one community policing, if you will, getting in touch with the people and keeping your finger on the pulse of what the people need and want. And I believe that was the best way to do the problem-solving issue. You get in the communities and you know exactly what they want. A lot of times they throw money and effort into things that just simply don't work and it's just perpetuating itself over and over and over again. And that's one thing I don't like to do is things over again. And I'm a very logical person and I want to make sure that if I am sent to the task of a job that I know the hard of the mission, and basically I go at it, again, keeping the people first and foremost in the scope. And when I say that, I mean their rights and their value systems, gauging the community to bring peace and tranquility into that society. And that's what I wanted to do as a police officer. And I continued that as an elected sheriff. In 2010, I was elected into Delaware, where we had moved into Delaware, just over the Maryland line, if you will. And I saw that there was a challenge here. More so, there was a misinterpretation of the role of the sheriff and what the sheriff is supposed to be. And trying to look into it, I learned that there was, I guess, if you will, a government change in the role of the sheriff. By tradition, the sheriff's office in Delaware has done less than some of the other full law enforcement sheriff's offices in the country. But I also know that sheriff's offices around this country right now are being faced with challenges that they've never had before in the way of crime, transient crime, gangs and such, and breaking and enterings, home invasions, theft, all the things that come along with a decayed economic status. And one of the things that, in my mind, that had to happen was the people needed to find out what the sheriff was really about. Not so much just the law enforcement capabilities, but the interpositionary role of the sheriff, and that is the sheriff that's elected by the people. You ask yourself, why is a sheriff elected as opposed to being appointed? Well, our system of government in the United States has worked so well because the electorate gets to choose whom they will to go and represent them at various levels of government. And the sovereignty must not be diminished because you lose the focus of the people and what they need in the way of peace and tranquility in the community. And of course, the number one role of government is the protection of the people. And not so much just the sense of protection from criminal activity, but the protection of their constitutional values, everything that this country was founded on, and that basically is there to support family, family values, and the things that go along with protecting those things. And that's why I wanted to continue as an elected sheriff to do that and build the office of sheriff back to where it was intended to be by the Founding Fathers here in Delaware. And was this the first time, Jeff, that you ran for a position like this? That's correct. Wow. Okay. And this was back in 2010 then, and I'm looking here on Wikipedia, and it says that you won with about 54% of the vote. You defeated an incumbent, and you are, I guess, a Republican, and that fellow was Democrat. A guy by the name of Swanson, is that right? That's correct. And he was a sheriff in so seven, and he was also in law enforcement before that, such as yourself. How long is the sheriff's term? It's four years here in Delaware. This is what I think the audience is going to be wondering, because I was, because the first time I heard of this was an article I read on the internet on AmericanFreePress.net, the headline being Sheriff's Bushwhacked, Delaware Attorney General Strips County Sheriffs of Arrest Powers. And what I was curious about was, were there in Delaware arrest powers prior to this event occurring? Yes. In fact, the person who had a large hand in creating House Bill 325, Representative Pete Schwarzkopf, in an interview said, I'm not saying, and I'm quoting, he said, I'm not saying that they didn't have powers, I'm just saying they don't have powers now. 
And that begs the question, well, what was it that changed the office of sheriff from what he had at common law in the history for 300 years? Before the state police were ever thought of in 1935, there was a sheriff that was the law enforcement officer or conservator of the peace, if you will, a peace officer more commonly known, here policing Sussex County. And of course, this was before the population explosion and what have you, and the move of people retiring into Delaware and all of the things that attract people here to Delaware obviously made it a little bit different in its appearance and in its demography, if you will. The demographics have changed. There's more and more and more people moving in, so more and more challenges come about. But the sheriff was the key law enforcement and the probably the only law enforcement agent across the county that had the jurisdiction of the full county. And so you, know, you had constables and sheriffs working hand in hand, and then the state police came along in 1935. And I think what happened, for whatever reason, the counties began began to give the state more and more say-so in the policing field. And the needs for the citizens to have a police response was put off to the state because the state had more resources. And remember, we're only three counties, so it's a very small state and the resources right. are minimal. But again, as the demographics changed in Sussex County, we have become more and more populated and the tax base has gotten greater. But I think what happened was the county government itself forgot that the first role is to protect people, and that's what their job is supposed to do as government, that's the first role, and to protect their constitutional rights. And unfortunately, I think it's moved into a lackadaisical situation where the county, we're the only county, by the way, that contracts the state police as county police. And when you have a county entity contracting the state police, you already pay state taxes for state police services. And then on top of that, your county taxes that you pay for for police services go right to the same exact entity. And if that entity becomes overtaxed, then at some point, and overburdened, if you will, at some point, the county has to take different measures. Now, here of late, I'm hearing my constituency say, well, wait a minute, the old cliche was the state police were the best bang for the buck. Well, that might have been true when the population was sparse, but now that you have more and more challenges out here, we have 1,500 home invasions and burglaries in Sussex County last year, and that's a sizable amount to have to deal with. Not to mention the other calls that the state police have to respond to. Now, I'm not saying that to pitch a county police department because that's exactly what I don't want. I want the sheriff to be back into its full measure of law enforcement capability so that if the sheriff does see something or comes upon something that the deputies can respond and can react to protect the electorate, the sovereign, if you will, or the citizens. And they have put up this big block. Why, I don't understand. Some people say it's the money. Then there's those who will point their finger and say that the county sheriff is just going to explode into a huge level of government or county police. Now, the whole idea of this is I think these things that are coming down the pike, such as this challenge to the Second Amendment, property rights challenges, personal safety, all the different things that are coming out of Washington and out of the state capitals with regard to individual rights have awakened a giant, if you will, of people who were just going along in life, man managing life okay, and now all of a sudden they see their rights and liberties being diminished by whatever role you want to label it from the federal government. And recent cases, and I say recent as far back as maybe 20 years, you can see where the federal government is trying to usurp the role of the state, number one, and then the mission of the state under the 10th Amendment is supposed to be able to function as itself a government to govern itself and the people at the state level, which is what the 10th Amendment is all about. So you look at that individual state or sovereign state within the United States, and then of course the federal government comes in to assist where the states need it is all under the auspices of common law, the sheriff is supposed to function at the county level. You have to ask yourself, historically, why would the founding fathers create an elected sheriff who is the chief law enforcement officer, and it's been said so and declared in multiple, multiple court cases, common law cases, case law across this country, and it is a universal jurisprudence that's accepted by most governments, or 99% of the government. Why would Delaware want to take away the office of sheriff and remove that level of interposition possibility when they know full well that these mandates and different attacks and encroachments are coming from the federal government unless it's a design to try to line up with the federal government and take away the sovereignty of the sheriff and the ability of the county to interfere with those things, just as you saw in the 1997 case, Prince versus 
U.S., where Sheriff Mack in Arizona basically was confronted with a Second Amendment issue, and I believe it originated in 1994, and then the case came to court in 97. And the sidebar comments from Justice Scalia, who heard the case at the U.S. Supreme Court level, and it was a Tenth Amendment case, that the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer in the county, and the reason he is is to protect the sovereignty of the county and the wishes and wills of those people who want to have their county govern the way it should be, to benefit the people, that is. And that's one of the reasons I think that the attack is coming down upon sheriffs across the country is to erase the role of the sheriff so that encroachments can have a free path, if you will, or a runway to land on and eventually take away more rights and liberties. Sussex County, that would be considered in the eastern shore part, is that right? Correct. Lower portion of Delaware, geographically, it's if you're looking at the state of Delaware, it looks like a thin little strip of land that sits between the eastern shore of Maryland and then over to the Delaware Bay, down to Wicomico County, Maryland, which is Ocean City, and then, of course, across the board to the easterly direction is Worcester County, and that's the Ocean City border. And I'm looking at a little graph here of the population history, and for the benefit of the listeners, just to give them an idea, in 1790, the population of Sussex County was about 20,000. In 1890, 100 years later, the population didn't even hit 40,000. So in 100 years, it didn't even reach that. But the big jump, it seems, 1980, 98,000, and of course, 2011, over 200,000. So it's significant. You can see the jump that I'm referring to. And of course, anybody that has a thinking mind can realize that when you bring population in like that, people looking to retire and what have you, it brings crime. And opportunity for criminals to come in to break into people's houses that may not have their guard up or understand exactly what's going on here. And of course, on the other side of the coin, you have a system of infrastructure in Sussex County that's not prepared for those influx of people. Now, the sheriff ran the jail, the big jail that's down here, until the latter part of the 50s and the early 60s, and then that was remitted to the state. It seems like a lot more has been given to the state. And to me, anyone who's liberty-minded or liberty-thinking, you don't want to give too much power to the state from the county situation because at that point, you have to bow to the state. Whatever the governor says goes. If you're in a southern portion of a larger state and you like to live rural and the rules come from the more populated areas, they're being made in the cities and then no consideration for what is necessary to live in the rural area, you're going to have mandates and things coming from those city thinkers. And we don't want to live. That's the reason a lot of people move to these less populated areas so they can have a little more peace and a little more comfort and quiet. And one can take one example and say, well, I moved down here to get away from the noise and the hustle and bustle, and they love the smell of the farm community. And then you've got those every now and again that'll rear up and say, well, I don't like the smell of a chicken farm. Well, that's inherent to the rural population and what is down here in the way of industry that creates a living for, I think it's 800 farmers right here in the state of Delaware. That fellow you mentioned before, was that Wartoff? Is that the same spelling as Norman Norman? I believe it is. You know, if he's related to him? or I don't think so. Okay. I've been told that he is not related to him. Norman's first call for General Force Call's father, I think, had something to do with the state of New Jersey police, New right. Jersey State Police, rather. But this particular Force Call, I don't believe there's any relation at all. This Force Call is a retired captain from the Delaware State Police, and therein lies some of the motivation or the factor of the motivation, I think, that had to do with the pit of the state police versus the sheriff here. And I think a lot of people are thinking, especially in the field of the state police, that if the sheriff were to get a toehold, he's going to be the county police to replace the state police, because that happened in the northern part of the state with the Newcastle County. Now, of course, Newcastle County exercised her sovereignty and picked and chose to go ahead and bring in a county police because they thought a closer government would be a better government. Most conservative people think that way. And that's a good thing because it goes right back to what I was saying, that if you have people that are closer to you, they're more accountable to what happens in your own community as opposed to what you might have in the way of a response from a state police agency. Now, let me make it clear that I'm not berating the state police at all. They do a great job. But when you're overworked and basically stretched thin, it's very difficult for any policing agency to provide the best service and the top-notch service that I think Sussex County deserves. And this was House Bill 325, is that right, Jeff? Yes. Basically, the beheading of the sheriff bill is what a lot of people refer to it down here. Yeah. And when was that? What was the date of that? I think it was signed into law by the governor on June the 20th, I believe, 2012. Okay, so not even a year ago. Now, what powers existed prior to June 2012 that don't exist now? 
Well, at the statutory level, there were various powers. In fact, if you look at the bill itself, it crosses out the role of the sheriff in many different ways. First, if you go to the definition section of the Delaware Code, it said that sheriffs were under the law enforcement definition, were law enforcement, the law enforcement agency. They recognized that. Secondly, if you go to Title 11, Section 8302, where it mentions the power of the state police, prior to 2007, then Pete Schwarzkopf, again, removed the word sheriff out of that definition. Definition. It read that the state police shall be the conservators of the peace throughout the state, and they shall have police powers like the sheriff, constables, and other police officers within the state. And then they go on to describe what a conservator of the peace is supposed to do, and that is to protect the people, arrest the bad guys, and put them in jail. And that right there showed the intent of the founding fathers and even the legislators at the time that they recognized the value of the sheriff then. And then politics entered the picture, and the control of the office of sheriff, which, by the way, and this is is really the crux of this whole thing. Okay. The office of sheriff is an elected office. He has the common law powers of arrest, and that's why the state law doesn't really affect that, because you can't change a constitutionally empowered office by state statute. You can't do it. That's what protects the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, all the different things that people value very, very, and the Second Amendment as well. When you make just willy-nilly off the cuff, make a state law that says the sheriff doesn't have any powers of arrest without considering case law, common law, and of course the constitutional enumeration in Delaware says the sheriff shall be the conservator of the peace. And of course they say the conservator of the peace is not defined in the Constitution. That's their argument here today. And all I do is point my finger to the title that I just mentioned to you that gives the state police that very same title and then goes and describes what they're supposed to do to enforce the law. You know, they're supposed to act on breaches of the peace. So if a conservator of the peace when the Constitution was written doesn't mean the same as when they describe the state police in the same state, I'll tell you what, I'll eat my hat because there's one thing that can destroy that kind of idealism and lie and that is politics, because as far as I'm concerned, politics is a lie. So basically, when the first sheriff in Delaware took office in 1669, if this number is correct, until 2012, they changed from that point? I think slowly over time, the sheriff was diminished, especially in the 1900s, early 1900s. There's records of the sheriff making arrests. Now, more often than not, sheriffs make arrests out of the courts because he is a function or a part of the court system, an arm of the court, if you will. That's why most sheriffs operate jails in their own counties. They are to bring to a appearance the summoned person to answer for their crimes, and so the sheriff is to house the jail and to maintain the prisoners there. Now, in order for him to follow that common law precedent, the sheriff has to be able to take into custody any person who violates the law. It just goes hand in hand, and the prudence of that whole entire system means that the sheriff has what he needs by way of tool and process to be able to not only maintain the jails, but to effect an arrest to make sure that that person is in a custodial situation when the court summons that person. And of course, the summonsing is part of the sheriff's common law duty, as is transporting prisoners and what have you. You can tell that this is political in Delaware because of the fact that they have diminished the role of even transporting prisoners and handling court documents. Our courts issue a document for purpose of arrest. It's called a warrant or a writ, if you will. Some states it's called a capius. It says right on the top of it, to any sheriff, constable, or police officer. And you are hereby to take into custody and bring before the judge. And that is basically a general writing on the top of the documents that recognizes, again, the historical aspect of the Delaware Sheriff and what his charge was before the state police took over. So to me, there's no question in my mind, anybody that's a logical thinker and that looks at government today as overstepping its bounds will know right away once they read this and the facts come out that this is nothing more than an attack to control the office of the sheriff that is the people's office of the sheriff and that his law enforcement role if taken away, opens the door clear and wide for a police state. The other two sheriffs, because you said earlier there are three counties in Delaware, the other two sheriffs, are they just rolling over or are they standing with you? Well, you know, unfortunately, if you look at our Congress right now, how many times have deals been made and hands been shaken that forget the law and abrogate the entire responsibility that they have as representatives of the sovereign, which is the people, and done their own deals that basically give the people the short end of the stick. And that's exactly what they're doing up there. They're refusing to look at their oath of office. I put my left hand on the 
Bible and I raised my right hand and I swore before God, my creator, to make sure that I kept the oath of office, understood it, number one. If anyone doesn't understand, they shouldn't be running for the office of sheriff, which is an office of the people. Right. And if they're not going to do the full and complete duty to defend the Constitution, to uphold the Constitution, which to me says every portion of it, they are responsible for it. And of course, they're responsible to the people to make sure that those duties are done. If those duties are diminished or abrogated or negated in some way by some fiat or governmental takeover, to me, it's not a legitimate takeover. The only way that they're going to get rid of the sheriff and the power of the people in the office of sheriff is to basically amend the Constitution in the state of Delaware. And there's no doubt in my mind that there will be some future attempt to do that if the people in Delaware don't stand up. And of course, I should say it's all over the United States because the attack on the sheriff is not just here. It was put to me distinctly that if there's an attack on the office of sheriff throughout this country and the people don't recognize that when they reach out for law enforcement, that is the people of the county, the first contact that they have that has the power to protect them is the sheriff because he's elected and answers directly to them, not to any other sovereignty, unless he's appointed. There are some appointed sheriffs throughout the country, but if he's elected, he answers directly to the sovereign, which is what my oath of office says, too, that I also serve the sovereign as elected. And I don't answer to the county council, neither does any other elected sheriff other than to agree upon some form of a budget that supports, and this is the key right here in Delaware, it's supposed to support the common law duty of the sheriff within that county. And if there's a need at the county level for the sheriff to be active in law enforcement, then that particular county council is basically duty bound to support the office of sheriff to cover the expenses that is necessary for that particular sheriff to go out and cover the role of being the conservative of the peace or peace officer within that county. And here, just because it's been diminished or hasn't been practiced, what I was told was if the sheriff is being attacked and the tip of the spear of that is right in the heart of Delaware. Right now we're seeing, and it's unfolding before our very eyes in the courts, that they're looking at the sheriff and only and considering only the traditional sense in the lower court, that is superior court. The judge, in fact, made the comment that we are a nation of 50 nations, and that's quote unquote, and that he's going to judge this particular case not on common law, not on case law, not what the rest of the United States thinks that a sheriff is and the typical jurisprudence and universally accepted jurisprudence of the sheriff's definition or conservative of peace, but he's going to go on what Delaware has by way of law in the history. Now, again, Delaware is very small. There may not be too many challenges in the courts as to what the office of sheriff is because other sheriffs, probably more so in the early 1900s to the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were sheriffs that did not understand that role and therefore did not take that position to protect the people and understand it. Many of them, in fact, most of them were not law enforcement officers prior to taking office as sheriff in Delaware. And because of that, they are certainly not going to understand the jurisdiction they have over the process of justice. They simply don't understand it, they're not going to go forth and take it on if they don't have the confidence. But you know, it was also said to me that, you know, you take the body and you tie the arm down on the body, it doesn't cease to become the body. It still has a role and a responsibility to the body, not only to the body, but to the balance of the body. And if you tie it down, it doesn't stop. It begs to be loosened so that the body can be rebalanced, and that is the service to the people. Once you loose it, you have to build it up and strengthen it for the purposes of balancing the body. And that's what's supposed to be happening here, especially in these days of challenge. To serve the people, you have to have certainly a well-balanced government here to serve the people. And that's what I'm trying to do. I just want to go back to this Schwarzkopf bill, this House Bill 325, because I'm looking at a website here. It looks like it's the Delaware Democratic Party, and they have a story here. Schwarzkopf introduces bill clarifying powers of county sheriff. And in that piece, it says, we have one sheriff who thinks he is above the law, and that is why we need to do this. The other two sheriffs understand what their authority is. I imagine he's talking about you as being above the law. Oh, I'm sure he's made some sort of a response or some sort of a cliche he's assigned to me because he simply doesn't understand the concept. Right. I was going to say it's pretty ironic that he's saying that you think you're above the law when all you're trying to do is uphold the law. Correct. It doesn't make any sense. But what actually precipitated House Bill 325? What was it that got this guy to the point of saying, hey, I need to introduce this bill here to handcuff the sheriff? Well, it started when I put my hat in the ring to run for sheriff. My own county council, who claims to be conservative, 
And I can tell you right now, if they are conservative, they're not conservative as far as I'm concerned and what most conservatives consider by considering and placing the Constitution as a center part of the skeletal operation of this whole body of government. They look at it, as far as I'm concerned, again, they look at it as an unnecessary position because they're thinking that it's going to turn into the county police. Well, you know, it's ironic. They have the power the only ones who have the power. I can go in and ask for $5 million or $50 million all day long. If they say I can't have $10, then the sheriff's going to stay just the size that it is. But here's the ironic thing. If the people recognize that they need more policing and more authority throughout the county and more presence of police, then shouldn't it be incumbent upon the people and then, of course, the representatives in the county council to respond to the will of the people to make that happen? And, of course, the power of the sheriff has really nothing to do with that. If the sheriff has powers of arrest, he himself can do it by himself with one or two deputies, if need be. But if the people recognize and see that the sheriff is doing a better job than subletting their policing out to the state police agency, this is hypothetical, but if they want that to happen, then shouldn't it be the people who contact the representatives? Isn't that what representative government's all about? Isn't that the way it's supposed to roll, if you will? And people then say, we need more presence. And not only that, but because we are the way we are here in Sussex County, we want the officials of that particular agency to be closer to the people so that they have their finger on the pulse and know exactly what's going on. The state police often bring people in that aren't from here, and they don't understand the people here. If they are a little different, the cliche is slower, lower Delaware. If they don't understand that cliche and understand how the people want to live down here, which is in a slower pace, you're not going to get the type of response from those entities or agents, if you will, of the policing process to understand that this is Farmer Smith. These particular people are doing this because it's traditional in Delaware. They may not understand that, whereas a local sheriff, a local law enforcement agency is going to understand it because they're from here. After all, Republicans always say it, closer government's better government. Conservatives say it as well. Why is that? Because people are accountable to people face to face. If it becomes more and more and more a state police state, we're going to have just what I said, a police state. There is no other option for policing that you can call right now because the county council has not done their job. Now, to go back to them to address your question a little more in detail, this whole particular bill process started right in the county council chambers, and it's all about the control of the office of sheriff. And I go right back to the old saying that I said, I am a sovereignly elected sheriff. They don't like it when I say that, but it's true. I ran for office, and I was elected as a sheriff. It is his discretion as to what he does policy and procedural-wise in his office. The state should be supporting him in the sense of law enforcement. I told you before that as far as the state law was concerned, they considered the sheriff a law enforcement agency up until this bill came about. So it should be treated as such and not enter politics in it to abrogate the entire process and the power of the people through the office of sheriff. So it went from the county council to a gentleman by the name of Danny Short, who is a Republican. He introduced this bill, and by the way, his father was a state trooper. He introduced this bill, and he got the response from the Republican Party that that's not what we want. He simply handed it off to Pete Schwarzkopf, and Pete Schwarzkopf took it on, and he said, I really don't care what the Republicans think or what the voters think. We're just going to go ahead and fast-track this bill and do what we got to do. Anybody who's conservative in Sussex County, I'll say it this way, are incensed by Mr. Schwarzkopf's actions, not only just pertaining to the sheriff's office, but many other things that are happening and going on right here in Sussex County. It simply is not a conservative value agenda with him. He wants to take people's guns. He wants to do everything that he can do to progress himself through the system and by whatever and maybe the popular idea of the day. I don't think he grasps at all the intent of the Constitution to keep the people free, to keep their liberties strong, and to keep conservative values here in Sussex County like they need to be. He's simply an advocate of the other side. Are you allowed to carry a sidearm? Oh, yes. When you look at us, you would never know that we're not a full-service sheriff's office. We're fully armed, uniformed, and what have you, but that's diminishing as we go along, which is why I sued. Every time I turn around, they're trying to take control of the vehicles. My county council tells me that the vehicles belong to them. I promptly remind them that it belongs to the people of Sussex County, and I'm trying to do this in a peaceable manner so that the people make the decision, and we are able to, through the electoral process, change. And I know it's not going to happen overnight, but again, as the people, the conservatives, conservatives, if you will, that long have valued traditions here in Sussex County as being as they are, and then coupled with the fact that the attacks are coming from the state, from our own governor, 
on, and I can guarantee you, and I'll say this as an individual citizen, I believe these people are looking to basically promote themselves to the process. They're not looking at the people in this. They're looking at themselves. I heard it said today on the radio that people were calling Senator Coon's office to try to persuade him not to vote on House Bill 35, which has to deal with Second Amendment rights. And the secretary in his office said, well, we understand your stance. However, Senator Coons is going to vote on this bill. Isn't it supposed to be a representative government? And that's one of the questions I ask you. And again, if there's any power play right now, look to Delaware, because Delaware is the most progressive in the state of Maryland as well, which is neighboring. They're the most progressive liberal stance and agenda. And of course, a lot of people say, well, didn't you fear retribution from these people and what have you by making these statements? Brother, I serve a bigger God than all of these guys. And what they have to threaten me with doesn't really scare me at all. I was going to actually ask you that, if you've been made to feel uncomfortable doing your job. Yes. I've been assaulted. I've been berated. I've been cursed at. I've been told that basically I have no future as a sheriff here. They're going to see to it. I have one county councilman who still threatens me to this day, and he makes it out to be about Jeff Christopher, and it's really not. It's about the sheriff and the office of sheriff here in Delaware. This guy doesn't know me. I've walked by him several times, and he has not even lifted his head when I'm in civilian clothing. He doesn't know who I am. That just goes to show you how much attention he pays to what's really going on around him. You were actually assaulted? Yes, I was. I was assaulted by one of the county councilmen. Physically? Yes, sir. Had a book thrown in my eye, struck me in the eye. What happened? Nothing. The attorney general refused to prosecute this guy because he's in with Flynn. He's mm. one of the good old boys and rolling with the system. Didn't surprise me at all. Oh, boy. It's pretty amazing. So in June, the governor signed this into law, House Bill 325. And how soon after that did you bring the lawsuit? It wasn't long. I had many, many people calling me. Every night I'd get two or three phone calls saying, you've got to do something about this. This is a direct threat on our sovereignty. And that being the fact that they understood the role of the sheriff. And as I've gone along, I have to admit that I've found out more and more and more as I've gone along and talked to people like Joe Arpaio and Sheriff Mack and probably another 100, 120, 130 sheriffs across this country have told me about their plight and what they're dealing with with regard to the federal government and some of their own state governments as well. New York State sheriffs, New Jersey State sheriffs, Florida sheriffs. I've even been on the phone recently with Colorado sheriffs whose legislature has threatened them that they will cut their salaries off if they start to block these gun agendas and these anti-Second Amendment people that in Colorado that are trying to pass these laws for no good reason whatsoever. This is all a hoax on the American people. It's fake. It didn't go down like the media says it did with regard to Connecticut. The problem with it is, is simply this. We teach these children in our schools that they are of lesser value if they don't fit in with the current regime. And on top of that, we teach them that we as people, the human race, came from animals or pond scum or whatever you want to call it. And then we expect them later on in life to respect human value or each other, if you will, and to treat each other like God intended us to treat each other. But then you brainwash them and tell them you're nothing, you came from nothing, so therefore you're probably going to go back to nothing when you die. Let me ask you, if you were a kid and you were influential to these things, how much frustration would that be with knowing full in your heart that you had some sort of a design about yourself and therefore there has to be a designer, but the logic of the world is completely and totally against that? It would commit to total chaos and confusion in your brain and, of course, frustration when you're bullied in school and you tell the system that you're bullied and they ignore it for whatever reasons they don't want to handle what's going on. You have a situation such as teen suicide going on in our schools because we as a government don't look look to that as the problem and mental health issues is at the top of the list. If we don't address these things, listen, we're going right down the tubes. And our government, for whatever reason, because of the liberal stances, they don't recognize that because to them, it's a peripheral problem. It's not something that's already in the roadway. And to most of the conservative sheriffs and chiefs of police out there, they know what the problem is. The cops know what the problem is. Go and ask any cop you want, unless he's drank the Kool-Aid that <laughs> these liberals sit on the table for them to drink. And they're going to know and tell the truth. And when they do, their logic is going to sound just like it supports the entire movement of the conservative race here in the world, especially in America. But I guess some of their words are going to try and attempt to support the liberal movement, but it's just not going to wash. And for the benefit of the listeners, there's about, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, about 3,000 sheriff offices in the United States. Yes, there's a tad bit over. I think it's 3,077, if I'm not mistaken, uh, mm -hmm. right around there. It's funny, a lot of those sheriffs, 
basically they'll defend the Second Amendment things, but there are some who refuse to go back in and defend people when it comes to the eminent domain challenges, property rights, things that you can do on your own property that the government has infringed upon that have been practiced and enforced for years. And we as a nation, if we're going to stay as a sovereign nation, we need to clean that cancer out from what our legislators have created in the way of chaos. And out of the 50 states, it looks like 48 have sheriffs. Alaska doesn't because it has no counties, and Connecticut doesn't because it has no county government as state marshals. You that is correct. Be. Now, that happened basically because the sheriff surrendered up there. They basically gave in, and I use the term drank to Kuwait, if you will. They were persuaded simply by a little bit of impression, and they should have defended their sovereign counties like they're supposed to do. But they didn't. They didn't. So it could happen to Delaware, and then it could possibly set off some kind of a chain reaction. Absolutely. Well, that's what I referred to as the tip of the spear. It was said to me by many sheriffs that if there is a concern right now about the power of the office of sheriff in the United States, the tip of the spear as it's thrust into that body is right in Delaware. Nowhere in the history of America has any legislative body ever declared the sheriff with no arrest powers or no law enforcement capability whatsoever. And that right there is evidence of the political takeover of the sovereign office of sheriff to protect the people. And if the people, listen, if the people choose it to be that way, then so be it. But I'm not going to stay here in Delaware and basically be railroaded by my own government that I pay to do it for me. (laughs) I'm paying them to basically suppress me. And that's not what the role of government is. But I dare say if people would wake up and look at what's going on, pay attention to what's going on, They're going to see, especially when it gets into their pockets and gets into their freedoms and gets into their liberties, that's when people are going to start waking up and paying attention. I'm just hoping it's not going to be too late at that point. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask you about. Can you get a sense of whether or not the people in your county are supporting you? Yes. I have conservatives, of course, and liberals as well supporting me. And the the middle-of-the-road people are supporting me simply because my stance is not to be a county police and to raise their taxes and what have you, because I understand it. I understand exactly what it's about. Uh, I used to be a chief of police. I understand how that, that works. But the basic logic of this thing is if you have an elected sheriff, and the office is there, and it's got a 300-year history, you have to ask the question, what is the sheriff for? What is the reasoning of the sheriff? And it's not just to be an administrative arm of the court, just to do what the judges say. He is a balance of powers in that status of the county. And if somebody, including the county council or the judicial system, goes rogue, now ask anybody where they live, have they ever been mistreated by a judge simply by the judge not giving the judicial balance to their case or to them as well individually as far as their rights. In other words, they didn't consider their rights at all and violated their constitutional rights. I guarantee you that every single county in this country is full of people who can name a judge who's done that. Now that right there is a part of the fact that the judges are part of the corporate. They're part of the state system that prosecutes people and puts people in this country at guard, if you will, or on guard with a system that's supposed to protect those rights and has foregone that particular duty and that stab them, if you will. That's one of the reasons why a sheriff was installed at the county level to protect those sovereignties and protect property rights. And that's what you hear when you hear the Prince versus U.S. case and Sheriff Max situation. That's what you're hearing right now with regard to Joe Arpaio. Tim Muller himself in Oregon has said it. He's a sheriff up there. John Lopey in Siskiyou County, California. I could sit here and name them to you for half an hour. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. That's right. And if they weren't standing up to paint this picture in its real sense, Not only is it logical and makes sense in the historical aspect, but it also makes sense in the way of the challenge that the government has placed upon the people of the United States today Mm -hmm. or the erosion of that. Now, you mentioned, of course, Sheriff Mack. Most of the listeners are aware of him. He's a great man, as you are. And he had formed an organization called the Constitutional Sheriff and Peace Officers Association. Of course, that's at cspoa.org. You're right there on the homepage. You work close with Sheriff Mack? I do. He and I basically talked couple years ago about this situation, and he recognizes the attack upon the sheriff in Delaware is on purpose for the purposes of the liberal side. They want to get rid of the sheriffs because the sheriffs at the county level, listen, everybody in this country lives in a county for the most part, except for D.C. maybe, and where are the rights violated? In the county, against the people, the very people that live in those counties. So what is the role of the sheriff? To protect those constitutional rights and those freedoms. And his job, if he chooses to do his job and his duty, he can 
continue to do what you know everybody else tells him what to do. But if he knows and he's educated enough to understand what his role is, he can set that role by way of policy and procedure, not only to be the law enforcement or chief law enforcement officer in that county, but to also be an interposer on behalf of the people and to basically ignore or at least suppress these actions coming from the federal government and state governments throughout the country. It's his duty to stand up. In fact, it's every duty of every citizen to get behind their sheriff because the sheriff's powerless without them. He has to have their support. He has to have their understanding, and he has to have their motivation. They have to go in and motivate the sheriff to say, listen, I know that you've been comfortable for the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it might be, even a year or two, being just this kind of sheriff. But right now, these new challenges, they basically they call out the need and duty for him to rise up and be the sheriff independently of any other level of government. He has to be the balance of powers within his county and make sure that the people are treated fairly by the rest of the process. It's actually a very humbling position, is it not? It's a ministry. In fact, my attorney general here is Bo Biden, the son of Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States, doesn't consider at all in his agenda and his writings and his opinion the constitutional aspect of the sheriff and what that stands for. And the actual mission of the sheriff is to take something as simple as a prisoner into custody. Jesus himself had mercy upon prisoners and said something to the effect that you were the one who visited me in prison. Well, that places that individual right there in a situation that it infers an ignoring by the rest of society. And then there's some humble person who comes and takes the time to visit that person because they realize that that person, too, is a child of God and understands that that person may have needs that are ignored by society. Whether they're criminal or not it makes no difference. I think we all have sinned and fallen short of God's will. At least my Bible says that. And anybody who thinks they have it, they've got another thing coming. But I certainly think that it is a ministerial function. The sheriff has to be in better touch with the people. He's not there just to enforce the law, which basically is what I've been describing to you. His interpositionary role is the people that he knows. He has to stand for them and stand up for them, especially look at the elderly. They lose their edge and their sharpness as to what's being done with them. And that's why criminals take advantage of those of that demographic is they know they just want to live in peace and they don't have their guard up because they trust people. They trust people that the guy that's coming to the door is not going to take advantage of them. But who ensures that? Who makes sure of that? Is it just a policing system or is it a system of law enforcement that makes contact with them, reassuring them that, hey, listen, we're here. We're here to protect you. Here's my number. Call me anytime you need me. You provide that avenue by which they entrust and value your service. On the website, they have a little button here to donate SOS support our sheriff. Is this something that folks should be aware of on not just yes. this website? Are there any other any, sites? Any liberty-minded person who wants to protect his constitutional rights, what we're doing is this case in Delaware is a precedential case. It basically says, does the sheriff have any power of arrest whatsoever at all? And if it does, everything that's based on that has to be common law, has to be case law throughout the United States. If there is a way that these badgers in Delaware find to diminish the sheriff or get rid of the sheriff, it's coming to a state near you or in your state, I guarantee you. And what we're asking is people, if they can spare $20, $50, $100, go to that CSPLA.org, donate there because 100% of the proceeds go right to the attorneys to make sure that this case is adjudicated in the proper sense. And when I say that, I carefully selected these attorneys. I had to go outside of the state of Delaware to do so because no one wanted to battle Mr. Bo Biden for whatever political reason they cited to me. So I went out of the state. I had to do that and and come back into the state by means of trust, if you will, through people I could trust that are in the law firms that surround me and that I've established a relationship throughout my career in Maryland. And doing so, basically, I selected those who respect the Constitution and its value and will not compromise that at all. And they have assured me, basically, they're going to go at this the way that I think, the way that most of my supporters and conservative-valued or conservative-minded people think. They would press that button for whatever reason that motivates them, if nothing else, the desire to stay free, to remain free, and help me fight this lawsuit. I'm trying to do this in a peaceable sense so that we don't have to resort to violence. I hope we never, ever have to have a revolution, but I fear that if the government itself gives us no choice, then we may have to respond that way, and to that, I say, God help us. I see you've raised a little bit over 8000 What number are you looking to get at? 
Well, it stands at this point at about 120000 By the time it goes through the second level, which is from Superior to Supreme Court, it may reach the $200,000 mark. And that is because of constant research, amicus briefs, all the different things and levels that we may have to go through. And that's probably the outside figure, I'm guessing. But my hope is that if this judge at the lower level would rule on our behalf recognizing the Constitution, then we wouldn't have to go through the second level of court. And that in itself you know, begs the idea that we're going to have to defend our Constitution. If he doesn't consider the Constitution at this level, we're going to have to go to the state Supreme Court. And if we can get some remedy there, then we can stop. But we think that it may have to go to the United States Supreme Court before we can finish. Listen, in a fight and a revolution, it's going to take every single resource we have to stand up against this giant. But we outnumber them so many to one, and the estimates have been up to 150,000 to one who are conservatively minded that just haven't taken action yet. And I think in America, we can have those conservative values back. The peace that we all seek to be left alone from a government that wants to harass us on every turn of the block. I believe we can have that back because if we fight for this and we educate ourselves about this awareness, attend some of those venues that are teaching these things around your county, look into it and get involved in this and including your pocketbook because let me tell you, what's the good of having a large bank account if you can't spend it when the government seizes it and they use it for whatever eminent domain that they think is better for you? Listen, God created you to think and survive and to do the things that you need to do as an individual person, individual thinker. He trusted you to choose what is right and wrong. Who is the government to say that it's their job to do so? So that's what liberty is all about. That's what conservatism is all about. We don't need a government that creates more laws. We have laws now that the government refuses to enforce right. because of some political agenda that they have. So we don't need more laws to restrict us. We need more understanding of what the laws are, and more clarified laws that are put on the books, and they need to be basically there for the majority of people to protect them, not to remove their rights. You're not going to give up, right, Sheriff? I am not. As long as God gives me the avenue to do this and challenge this, I'm going to continue to do it. I believe the people in Sussex County, of course, I have to be the sheriff in order to continue on this particular route here in Sussex County, but I believe the people here in Sussex County are behind me. I get thumbs up all the time, people blowing their horn and telling me, you know, we support you and I will stand for anyone's rights. If it's constitutional and it's constitutional base as far as what they claim, I will defend them. It might go against some of my own values or my value system as a Christian, and I've told people that. But I know how to separate those values to protect people's constitutional rights, and I will do that to ensure that our Constitution stays strong. Sheriff Jeffrey Christopher, Sussex County, Delaware Sheriff, I want to thank you so much for the time you spent explaining all this to the listeners and looking forward to speaking to you in a few months, hopefully, when Judge Graves makes his ruling. I'm looking forward to it, too, and I'm hoping to come back with you on a constitutionally based ruling considered by that judge. There's a lot of supporters out here who don't think that that's going to happen. In fact, I've been questioned about it, and I'm not sure what to tell people. I don't pretend to read the future and not going to try now, but I just hope that he does the right thing. And if not, we're going to certainly appeal it right straight up to the Supreme Court in Delaware, which I said before is going to cost us some money. I only make about $20,000 a year. I'm not shy about telling people that, but there's a lot of sheriffs in the country who basically have little to no salary at all, especially where, and I've noted this, especially where there's an intent to diminish the sheriff because they don't want anybody who in their right mind would ever come in and fight like this for 20000 a year. But I think that's their way of thinking, and I'm hoping to change their idealisms with that. I'm going to continue to fight as long as God gives me the avenue. Thanks again, Sheriff. Thank you.